Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's CDN and JISC's virtual bridge session. Uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. it is a bank holiday for some, um, and there is a great turnout for this uh, talk, um, judging by the numbers. My name is Andrew Stalker, and I am one of three JISC account managers covering the Scottish sector for both HE and FE. I will be hosting the session um, and we'll be keeping a track of any questions coming in the chat panel. Um, I will try and introduce people and bring people into the conversation as well where possible. Please do put your questions in the chat panel at the side um, and we will um, bring you into, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question to John, that would be great. So I have the great uh, pleasure of uh, introducing John McMillan, a digital learning specialist at the University of Stirling, who is going to be presenting on the key components to online learning design. So John, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll see in the chat that I've added a couple of links to some Padlet activities that could be interesting for you to uh, contribute to during the session or afterwards. Um, I'll just give an introduction to those first before I get started, because I think it could be interesting for conversation. Uh, so the first one is a kind of room 101 for digital and online learning. So are there any concepts, ideas or methods that you would like to consign to Oblivion? Uh, I think that would probably be quite an interesting one for people to get stuck into. And the other one is a more positive one, which is about your favorite methods for encouraging engagement and community building uh, in online learning. So feel free to contribute to those. Uh, I've got a couple in there already for some colleagues to get started, but contribute to those during the session afterwards and uh, we can have a, a good chat about them. But now I'm get on, going to get on with things. Um, there's not going to be a PowerPoint uh, presentation to go along with this. It's not down to some uh, idea about trying to avoid death by PowerPoint or anything like that. It's due to my complete ineptitude running the system because I ended up with uh, the PowerPoint taking over all of my screens and no time to figure out how I was going to sort that. Because I want to see you, because I want to be able to see if anyone's drifting off or if any conversations come in. Uh, so I hope that's not too much of a problem. I can share the slides afterwards because I can add some useful links and resources to them. All right. Uh, so first of all, a bit about my professional background and what's brought me here. Uh, I'm currently a learning technologist and learning designer at the University of Stirling. I've been there for about 18 months. And prior to that, I was an instructional designer and an educational development leader at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, through those roles, I've had lots of learning design and, techno and uh, learning technologist work across the different sectors that we all work with. So I've had further education, higher education, uh, and also some professional development side of things, both inside the institution and with NHS Island. So there's quite a varied background uh, that is fed into what I'm uh, going to be talking about today. Um, what I'm gonna talk about, it's kind of my key concepts. It's quite subjective. Uh, there are lots of other ones out there and I would love to hear about critiques about what I've said, anything that I've missed, anything that would be your uh, key concept. And we're going to stop at a couple of key points during the session. So any questions that you put in the chat, uh, Andrew's going to keep up with those and we'll deal with those throughout the session. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that right now we are moving, uh, certainly our, our focus at, at Sterling is moving from emergency pedagogy, which was all about getting through those final three weeks. For us, it was three weeks. I think for others, it was a bit more. Three weeks of teaching at the end of the spring semester. And we're now moving on to the point where we have to think about autumn, when we have a far more considered approach to online learning and how we are going to introduce that to students, how we're going to support it. So we're in a big shift from firefighting to something that's a lot more uh, thought out and, and planned. So key things that I thought I would talk about today, first of all, would be about planning and storyboarding, then uh, resource design and evidence and uh, literature that's useful for influencing that. Social presence, 
authentic assessment and then considering student needs. Uh, so uh, feel free to add any questions you have throughout the session and I'll now get started with it. Uh, so the first one, planning and storyboarding. First one, uh, first thing that I've got here that underpins everything is trying to find some kind of framework for planning what you're doing. The one, one that I tend to go with is constructive alignment, which is uh, the method devised by, uh, I think it's John Biggs, sur surname certainly Biggs. Uh, and there's a lot more information about that available in some of the uh, publications that he's made in his Biggs and Tang uh, textbook that is quite often cited as one of the main uh, things you might encounter in the training for learning and teaching. But the reason I think that that's really important is that it acknowledges a lot of things that students bring to the learning situation. So one of the things that he's cited as important is the way that students see the assessment as the curriculum, not the content, not the intended learning outcomes, not what you plan. It is all about the assessment because that's going to determine what they get at the end of it. So the way that we plan these things uh, has to consider how the assessment is done, what the route is going to be through it. So that process all starts with writing good learning outcomes that can be met by assessment. Then planning and designing assessment that's going to meet those needs. And then after that, you think about all of the learning and teaching activities, the content uh, that's going to have to fill that gap to get students from where they start to the point where they can demonstrate proficiency uh, uh, and meeting those intended learning outcomes. So to me, that undermines everything uh, that I would be trying to do. Uh, there are lots of models that can be used for learning design after that. Uh, we tend to use the Carpe Diem model and Jilly Salmon's five stages model to fill in that gap between uh, intended learning outcomes and assessment. So how we would plan that out is quite often based around Carpe Diem. There are other frameworks available. Uh, lots of them are really useful and they can be suitable for your needs. I know that the ABC method is very popular at the moment and we have looked at using that in certain, certain circumstances. So when I say that we use uh, Carpe Diem, it's not me saying Carpe Diem is the best, it's what's worked for us and it's been an effective way to get staff up and running with their learning design. Uh, the next part that is also embedded in all of these frameworks is the idea of active learning and the idea that we want students to be doing things. So as part of your planning, as part of your storyboarding, you want to be thinking about what you want students to do at each point. What are the activities throughout the weeks that are going to lead to them being able to demonstrate in, a, in an assessment what you want them to be doing, what you, how, how are they going to meet their intended learning outcomes. Um, in an online environment, we have to think about how often are the students going to be uh, working in groups? Where are they going to receive feedback? Could it be useful in this situation to incorporate more peer feedback uh, as, as something to build social presence, which I'll uh, talk about later on. And I think one of the things that has come up for me quite often is that activities in traditional in-person teaching are often defined by timetables and the structures that we're working in. So you will have quite often maybe two hours of lecturing and one hour of seminars or labs or something like that. That is all of the face-to-face -face time that you have with your students. And in the current situation, I think there's something a bit liberating about now being able to break this up a lot more so that instead of having two hour blocks where you try and transmit knowledge to them and an hour where, where you try and work with them in groups or work through some problems, we're now a lot more free to use the online environment to put out some content, then ask them to go and read up on, a, on, a, on the activity and then come in and do the group work in a wiki, in a discussion board. You might still be running webinars like this, uh, but trying to get people um, engaged in those environments. So we're, we're a bit freer now that we're free of the physical structures. Um, 
So I think I'll stop there on the planning uh, and see if, see if there are any questions. Feel free to open your mics as well if you want to ask any questions. So the first question already come in from um, Jason Miles Campbell. Jason, do you want to come in and ask the question over the microphone? Yes, go on then. Um, I was just wondering what the relative benefits are, you think, between an institution deciding upon a methodology and having a culture around that and support for it and all the rest of it versus giving people the latitude to decide their own methodology according to their circumstances and predilections. Yeah, I, I think it's really good to have an established methodology that you can get people up and running with some of the ideas. So, so that then if people decide that they want to go off and do, say for example, we tend to use Carpe Diem for a lot of our on-campus models where we're, when we are working on it by ourselves. But for one of our online programs, we work with an online partner who have their own framework for how they develop things. Um, and we work through that with them. So some of my learning design work is in partnership with this external group on these, um, on, I think we've got one program at the moment, two are coming up. Uh, so we already have the idea that we, we tend to go with Carpe Diem. Some of our staff are then encountering this other framework. So it's been really useful for us to actually have something we constantly relate back to it. So the five stages model, we will be able to refer to that when we're working with the external partners and say, well, how are we building that community across the 12 weeks of this program? How are we doing that? So I think it's good to have a central one because then if people do their own thing, if they find that for their discipline or for their setup, something else works better, you know, there's, there's a standard that they're able to peg that at. And it, 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 that's been really useful for us because I don't think we've officially adopted Carpe Diem as something that we promote, it's just something that we tend to go with. Thank you very much. Um, second question from Alan Morton. Uh, Alan, uh, would you like to come on or would you like me to read the question out for you, please? I'll do it, that's okay. Great. So uh, the question is, what are some effective low bandwidth solutions? Um, uh, I've got several learners who don't have broadband access at home, so are using phone data. Right, yes, uh, that's something that's has been at the forefront of my mind over the years because, um, well, j just to give you, you know, this might be a bit of an overshare, but I'll go for it anyway. We're all friends here. Um, I, I, I'm an islander and I'm from a rural part of an island where genuinely after uh, there was heavy rain, we would have to call up BT to empty the exchange with a bucket because <laughs> it would get flooded and switch off our internet. So it's, and the BT call centers never believe you until they put through a call to the local BT engineers who say, yeah, I'm going to pop down with a bucket and, and we'll empty it. So that's something that is at the, at the forefront of uh, my mind. And as we've moved in the final weeks of last semester, we were trying to figure out what do we do about people who don't have any internet, don't have any Wi-Fi, in some cases don't even have a device, about how we can get through that. So one of the things we've tried to do uh, is, you know, at also, you know, as part of the design saying, if you're making video, does it have to be video? You know, how much of this is important? And this will, you know, I'll come on to a bit more of this later with the resource design and social presence. But there's a lot of this content that can be delivered really effectively if it's just audio. So having a, a download option for audio is something that uh, you can build into what you're doing where it's really useful to be able to see someone's face to see that you know the way that they're presenting themselves it can be useful for maybe the introduction to a week the introdu introduction to a unit or a module to be able to see someone and how they project themselves um, and hopefully have some kind of system that's going to stream quite effectively because i know that even when i was uh on a you know an, an internet service that was coming through a wet piece of string, a very wet piece of string at times, uh, a lot of the streaming services were able to catch up with that somehow, you know, by giving me control over the quality that was coming through, but by being able to properly buffer and stream 
some of these things. So try and try not to make it too multimedia heavy, mm -hmm. trying to make use of services that are actually going to stream properly. So I know one of the things we try to make sure people do is don't just put video into the VLE where it's not going to handle it perfectly. Uh, we have uh, the Panopto system for our video manage management, which will give people, you know, a lo-fi quality all the way up to 1080 and possibly 4K if they have a, a, a connection that will manage that. So you can certainly get that on uh, the Panopto system. YouTube will do that. Uh, Medial, which I know some of some institutions are using, Vimeo, all of those things, they give you a lot more control over what's going to work for your connection um, and give people that choice to manage it because if it doesn't need to be high def, tone it down. And I think there's very little that we do that has to be high definition video. No, I, I can echo that. One of uh, the things I, I did early on in the lockdown was send feedback to my learners individually as individual audio files. So rather than give them text feedback on work was uh, was my voice, you know, recording what I wanted to say, um, and then they were quite appreciative of that. So I can I can I think that's a that's a good response. Thank you. Yeah, and on that one on the feedback, we've also found that some people have found it quicker to add some of the audio feedback, and on the idea that you know being liberated from physical space. I don't know what the working environments you would have had in, in your offices is, but I know that Sterling, we have a lot of shared offices mm -hmm. and the idea, you know, bustling corridors right behind a door. So at home, it might not be the perfect environment. We might have caring responsibilities. We might have kids, dogs, partners who are gonna burst in on whatever is going on without warning. But being at home can sometimes give you just that little bit more space where you can record some of these things quite quickly. And I know that for some of our scripting work, uh, there's a lecturer who's actually going to do uh, text to speech to do it because he think it, thinks it's gonna be quicker. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of these options out there from uh, uh, even built into the Office platform these days. So there's okay, a lot of really good stuff. Right. I'm gonna move on now to the next section, but uh, any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat while we're going on. I'll try not to get too distracted by them until we pause again. Because I know I have, a, I have a habit of being a bit like a rabbit in the headlights when that happens. So and I accidentally muted myself. That's brilliant. Okay. So the next section uh, is about some of the evidence-based uh, resource design. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the idea of you know, content is not king. And I think that, you know, that's absolutely true. But I think we also have to acknowledge that the content is part of the overall learning experience. So while we don't want to fixate massively on the content, we want to consider how we design the content that is there so that it maximizes engagement and isn't damaging to the engagement that's going on. Uh, so some of the things that we found through our practice and through engaging with the literature is that um, the length of audio and video components can affect not only student engagement with that individual video, so how much they watch, it can also affect, uh, based on the research, how they engage in activities around it. So if you were delivering 40 minutes of video content, it would be really damaging to student engagement to just have that 40 minute chunk of video and then expect them to go off and do a whole bunch of activities. Whereas if you break it down into chunks of maximum of six minutes, chances are you're not going to need the full 40 minute runtime and you're also going to intersperse activities amongst it. So students are more likely to watch the full video. They're more likely to engage in the activities that you've added in between and the activities can then build on each other so that you are not just at the end of it going, right, I've given you all of the stuff, go and do this now. You're you are saying to them, you know, whether it's a, a discussion about what do you think about this idea at this point or creating something and demonstrating their skills, then subsequently saying, right, let's expand on that. Let's explore deeper into the idea or build on those skills. So consider that length and 
most of the research that we, that we have seen has been on the video side of things, but I would try and apply the same to audio content if that's where you're going with, break it down into those chunks. And one of the methods that we have tried to adopt for how you do that is uh, something called segmenting, signaling and weeding. Uh, there's a research paper on this that I'm going to, I'll share afterwards so you'll get it in the resources. But this is a method of scripting your videos quite strictly, then reviewing them so that you're segmenting it, you're breaking it down into those chunks. So if you wanted to write, you know, basically what would have been a lecture script, then break it up, you can do that, but you then have to review it. So you do your segmenting, breaking it down into chunks. We found that three minutes of video quite often would be about 450 to 500 words. That's if you're speaking at a rate of around about 160 words per minute, which uh, some of our online partners who have done a lot more video content than we have, uh, have found to be the optimal uh, speed for speaking in their online videos. Signaling, that's part of the scripting process where you find methods of uh, emphasizing key points. So if you're in a situation where you have producers or technical ability, that might be uh, having graphics come in to emphasize what's going on. If it's just you speaking, speaking into a camera like this, you might just find those ways of repeating over and over again. So start off, give details, and then come back to give a conclusion. So it's things that a lot of us would do naturally, but in the online environment, we have to do things a lot more explicitly because we miss some of these, um, you know, the kind of physical cues that we tend to work with. You might see that just out of camera, like, you know, my hands are moving constantly. So there are, there's a lot that even in an online environment like this, we don't necessarily capture about what someone is doing. The final point that they have in the, in the design for the scripting is weeding. And that's taking out anything that is not important for the topic you have chosen for that video. So if we're speaking live, it can be important to try and build that bond. So before 11 o'clock, there was some nice chat between us. When we get to questions, there will be something that will emphasize the bonds we're building here online. But if this is a video that you're recording now and that students are going to see in October, what they need is the topic that it is on, not those specific, uh, not, not those little points that you might add in from time to time. So think about that when you're scripting. And we would try and script almost every every video. So segmenting, signaling, weeding, uh, key points for that scripting. John, just a quick question coming in. Is there a optimum length uh, of recordings? What, what would you say was the, the optimal length of them? You mentioned three minutes, but is that your finding that that's, that's where it should be? For online video, we would between three and six minutes because then six minutes is the maximum. After that, uh, engagement tends to plummet for, for average viewership. Uh, and this has been done with some quite big data sets on some MOOCs uh, where they've seen that uh, plummeting quite often. Um, in terms of webinars, uh, which I see Kenji has mentioned, that's not something I would tend to know about, but I know that for me, just you know, on a personal basis, after an hour, I tend to find myself flagging a bit, especially if it's something concentrated. So if you're sitting here engage, engaging with debate rather than chatting, an hour is something that, you know, after that, you are flagging. So you, if it's going to be more than an hour, consider breaking that up. Consider having not just comfort breaks, but having longer breaks where people can go and, you know, take the dog for a walk around the block or spend some time in the garden if the weather's not, you know, something like that, just to uh, give people um, give people that, that break. Um, uh, Walter has a question about which of the elements takes the most time effort, uh, segmenting, sig signaling or weeding. I, I think it's probably segmenting because there is a bigger part there about identifying what will work as a as a single video? What are the topics that are going to work? So you don't necessarily just want to hack it down to this is six minutes, we'll leave that there, then another six minutes. If you have it about discrete 
topics that are in your subject, that can be quite tough. And sometimes it might be the case of um, looking at how, if something is going to take you 15 minutes to talk about, where do you want to split that video so that students are actually going to engage in full with all of the content. Um, some are going to watch the full 15 minutes, but some are going to disappear after five minutes and not see anything after that. So segmenting for me uh, is the toughest part. That's the bit that takes the most. Signaling and weeding, that is more, once you've got the video down, you might think about how you deliver it. So you're going to take out the bits that don't feel relevant. You're going to emphasize the bits that are important. Uh, and the research that Kenji's linked to there is one of the key things that uh, we base a lot, a lot of what we've done on. And obviously it is a MOOC platform, so it is a slightly different learner base but the numbers that they're talking about, about how often that they've tested this, the scale of it just makes it something that's going to be relevant to most situations. And I know that it's, it's the same thing we've encountered with our online partners uh, for online learning. It is three to six minutes is the ideal place for online videos if you're doing them. Um, next thing, uh, I'm not going to talk much about accessibility here because accessibility is a topic all by itself that could take hours and hours to unpack. Uh, but I'm just going to briefly say when you're designing your online content, consider accessibility up front, consider all of your users. Um, with multimedia, always have text versions of your audio or video, which is a lot easier if you've scripted and planned in advance. That makes it easier if you're going to go down the caption view, uh, route or the transcript route. It works for both of them. Uh, if you're using any diagrams or images that are going to be vital for understanding of what's going on, have text descriptions of what, what those are. Um, and if you're going for closed captions, uh, don't rely entirely on, a, on automatic uh, captions, especially without testing because some of them can have some real quirks hidden away. You would be amazing how often our uh, previous system would confuse the word Sterling for Darling. So anyone who started their session off with welcome to Sterling, it would say welcome, darling. So if you're going to go with uh, those automatic captions, test them. Um, there's a question here from uh, Jason. I don't see reward built into online learning as often as I'd expect. It's used widely in engagement. Do we, do we need more or is it a distraction? This is something we were discussing with some of our uh, tutors the other day about some learning design, about having you know, kind of key hits in the, in, the, in, the, in the course that you want to use to motivate people. So I think it is, it is important and I know I really like the idea of things like open badges as a way to add bits of motivation, especially for um, skills that you might not necessarily associate with um, with the course. For example, if you're uh, studying something in the humanities and you go all in on something like um, uh, SPSS and using technology a lot more in your design than than you might expect it can be really useful to be able to show actually yeah I engage with it I didn't just do the minimum uh, but I think finding ways to what to reward people and make them feel that it's worthwhile it's really important so even if it's not necessarily that kind of gamified uh, thing I don't know if anyone else uses du Duolingo but um, it can at times go from being useful to being just a passive aggressive little owl who keeps popping up with you. So uh, if you're gonna go down the motivation route with these things, there's a balance and I'm not necessarily sure where that balance should be. Um, John, what we'll do now, if we, what we'll do is we'll bring the recording to an end, um, but we, and uh, as we come up to the half hour point, um, but what we will do, we will keep going beyond uh, this and, and continue the conversation, but for recording purposes, uh, we, will, we will stop here. Um, but yes, please do keep, there's a few questions coming in, so we'll continue the conversation. Yeah. So, 
just can I just quickly run through my final points because I yes, really of course, ran sorry, over sorry. where where I was, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. So uh, on the resource design, consider structure. Uh, we always have that idea that there, we we see a lot of it of the kind of bucket of content that gets thrown into a VLE. What are students supposed to do? Think about the narrative and how you weave a path through it. Uh, the next point I have uh, was about social presence. A uh, kind of broad definition of that is the feeling that people have that they are there in the environment. It counts for in person as well as online. Uh, but one of the things online is that people can, there's a kind of equilibrium model where people's interactions will be modified based on the context. So think about how you're going to build that. And something we think can be useful is an etiquette guide that is shared so that people know what's appropriate and what context. And you can consider ways that students could build that if you have an icebreaker, if you have people new to online learning. Um, and we know student satisfaction is linked to the sense that they feel part of a community. Uh, then authentic assessment as part of your design. Assessment is going to dictate everything if you make it creative and authentic. So it's something that's real, something that students can get keep stuck into. That's going to be really important. And the final one, just to wrap things up in the speed readers tour of the second half of the presentation, because I'd lost track of time, is considering student needs. There's a common phrase at the moment, which is we're not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. So thinking about that and the idea that we need to be compassionate about what students are facing, they are going to be learning in environments they never expected to be learning in. Um, they're going to have pressures that they never expected to be facing with schools not being out. There could be uh, 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 parents who are studying who now have children running around to need attention. How much synchronous engagement do you need? Some is important for social presence, but uh, it's not always vital uh, and also consider that many of our students did not sign up for online learning. They made a choice to sign up for courses that were taught in person on a campus. So we have to think about how we support them. Uh, and with that, that's, that, that's, a, that's the presentation done. So, thank, thank you, John. Really appreciate your time and, uh, and your, your insight. Uh, as I said, we'll bring this bit to, to a close, but uh, please do remain online and John will continue answering the questions that you have. So thank you.